As he said, my name is Peter Cartwright. I'm from the United States. Um, I've been in the water treatment industry for 47 years uh, with a lot of experience in membranes, but uh, I've had my own consulting engineering company for over 40 years, and <clears throat> uh, I've been concentrating in recent years about uh, in the area of wastewater recovery and reuse. Uh, there's uh, any number of reasons why this is an important and it's going to become more important thanks to climate change. So what I want to talk about today is a particular application of <clears throat> treating an industrial wastewater stream for recovery and reuse. And I'll get right to it. In this particular application, the client was a large recreational facility in California. I'm limited by non-disclosure as to um, any more detail about it other than they were out in the boonies where there was no municipal water supplier or wastewater treatment system. They're completely self-sufficient. Uh, very, very self-sufficient um, facility. There, uh, for example, they have gray water recovery and reuse. They have their own um, uh, sewage treatment system on, uh, on site. Uh, the organization is very committed to environmental stewardship. And um, there is a strong incentive in the state of California for what they call zero liquid discharge. Basically, uh, not allowing any liquid, basically water, to leave the facility. So uh, basically what does leave the facility are dry solids. The very first requirement, whenever you have an application like this, is find out what, what's in the wastewater. What is it that we have to treat? And the, the second requirement is what is the quality of water that you want to reuse? And in this particular case, they said the pH had to be within six to eight, which is standard EPA drinking water regulations. The TDS, total dissolved solids concentration, less than 500 milligrams per liter. Uh, again, standard EPA drinking water requirement because this water was being used within the facility for potable water applications. And the third requirement was a total hardness of less than 100 milligrams per liter. So in the feed water that was coming into the system, these are the parameters. A fairly uh, standard, nothing really uh, remarkable here. Uh, I might back up one moment to say, where did this, feed, this water come from? It was a wastewater, but it, what it was, was the waste discharge from electrodialysis reversal treatment system. I won't go into the, well, stupid uh, uh, decision that was made years ago to treat well water for the potable requirements within this facility with EDR as opposed to membranes. Now, I'm not completely objective because I've been in the membrane industry all these years, but at any rate, the wastewater here was the waste from an electrodialysis reversal system that was treating groundwater for the potable requirements of this facility. The other requirements that they had for this Treatment, total treatment system was a minimum reverse osmosis recovery of 85%, minimum reverse osmosis permeate rate of 35 gallons a minute. And I have to apologize for the fact that uh, although I spent a lot of time over here and I think in terms of metric, um, this was prepared for a, an American audience, so we still go with English units. Just take those numbers and divide by 264 and you'll get cubic meters. Minimum RO concentrate D TDS, the, 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 the total dissolved solids concentration of the RO concentrate stream was 20,000 milligrams per liter. And the total sludge production 
in other words, the dry material leaving the facility of 605 pounds per day. So here's the complete system. Here's the source of the wastewater, electrodialysis reversal. Here's the feed water to the treatment system. The permeate from the EDR goes to the potable water treatment facility. And then at the end of this system, the permeate goes to the potable water supply. So basically, this whole system is producing a permeate with uh, our quality meeting the potable water requirements. This is a rather busy slide, but basically we're adjusting the pH, but instead of going through the traditional soda, ash, lime clarification process, we're using uh, microfiltration membranes to dewater this precipitated material. Here's the tubular microfiltration. The concentrate from that goes to a belt press that's dewatering it. The effluent from the belt press is recycled. The sludge from the belt press is going to landfill. The permeate from the tubular RO, again, is going through pH adjustment because it had to be raised here, lowered down into a reasonable range. And this goes through reverse osmosis at high recovery. The permeate goes back to the facility. The concentrate goes to a post-treatment, which is basically evaporation, a concentrator and, uh, or a crystallizer and uh, evaporation. And the distillate goes back to the facility. And the sludge from the uh, evaporation process goes back to the landfill. So the pretreatment portion of this, again, the wastewater goes to a feed tank. That's treated with sodium hydroxide rather than using the relatively high sludge production chemistry of soda ash or lime. We are running it into two reaction tanks, to, and this is a pH of about 11, going to a concentration tank, and this uh, concentration, this uh, concentrated sludge or concentrated uh, precipitated material goes through the tubular microfiltration. This represents the membrane. Permeate goes to, to the reverse osmosis system. The concentrate is continuously recycled to bring the concentration up in the 3 to 6 percent range, at which point it goes to a settling tank and then to the belt press. The, the primary treatment, in other words, the, the polishing of the um, microfiltration permeate goes to pH adjustment to bring the pH down in a range of 6 to 7. RO system running at high recovery. Concentrate goes to the post-treatment, in other words, the evaporation system. Permeate goes to the, back to the feed for the facility. And then the post-treatment, which is basically evaporation. Falling film evaporator, crystallizer, centrifuge, and the solids go to the landfill, and the distillate goes to the potable water storage. Very simple design uh, in reality. So here's the complete system with the flows. Again, I apologize, this is uh, gallons per minute, but the the, the wastewater from the EDR system is about 40 gallons a minute. This goes uh, through the system. The bottom line is that we are recovering 35 gallons a minute of permeate uh, from the RO system going back to the potable water storage and uh, roughly five gallons a minute of distillate, distillate um, and then the sludge goes to the uh, landfill, the total between the belt press, which is basically, um, this is almost entirely uh, calcium and magnesium salts. Uh, silica was a problem too, but they, they chose, instead of going to a two-step precipitation with, with different pH uh, ranges, they chose to use an antiscalant with the RO 
to keep the silica from fouling the membranes. So basically, this is the calcium and magnesium compounds going to the landfill, and this is everything else in solids form, uh, about 2,600 pounds per day. So in conclusion, the zero liquid discharge system uses proven practical technologies. Uh, the, I guess the most interesting one here is the fact that we're using tubular microfiltration to dewater the um, calcium, the insoluble calcium and magnesium salts. And, um, and I, if I'd had my way, we'd have, been, we'd have precipitated the silica with magnesium chloride and, uh, and uh, ferric uh, salts. But at any rate, the, the, the pretreatment uh, for this, I think, is, is, is unique in that there is not that much in the way of uh, tubular microfiltration used for this application. But this is an excellent example of water conservation, uh, and this, I think, has to be looked at in industry today for industrial wastewater treatment. Uh, we, we have ways to biologically uh, very easily uh, recover wastewater from uh, municipal uh, facilities um, when you're you're dealing basically with sewage, but when you're dealing with industrial wastewater, every plant produces a different quality. So it's a, it's a challenge. These are some illustrations. This is the reverse osmosis system. This is the uh, tubular MF. More illustrations of the same equipment. Uh, again, this is the tubular microfiltration. Uh, this is the RO unit, and this is me. So thank you very much. Can I answer any questions, please? Um, yeah, for, for me, I, I have one question. Um, yeah, we, we have an, uh, a project that's called Zero Brine, and uh, the idea is that you valorized also the, the resources that are in the brine. What you see in your, uh, in your slide is that uh, all the magnesium, etc., goes to the landfill, but is it not possible to recover these magnesium salts and, and, and sell them or reuse them? Uh, yes, uh, and, and in some applications um, uh, this is being done. It's a purity issue and a market. Uh, but certainly gypsum, for example, uh, uh, is one place where it could be used. Um, and that's kind of the ultimate. Take these solids and, um, you know, you can talk about taking the, the, the uh, evaporated uh, solids from, the, from that portion of it, from the RO concentrate. The problem you have there is you've got a lot of different salts. But uh, that, that certainly would be the ultimate. In this case, they're not doing it. But, uh, and really, based on my experience, when you're dealing with zero liquid discharge, the, the, the challenge, of course, is the energy requirement of the evaporation. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Thanks for your presentation. Well, an impressive process, and I think you can produce a high-quality drinking water with that process. But on the other hand, I see a lot of chemicals used, a lot of energy uh, probably used. Uh, did you also look at the carbon footprint, the energy footprint, and did you make a comparison with the normal drinking water treatment? Uh, I guess in response, I'd say no. The first answer is no. Uh, they did not look at the, at the energy requirements at all. Uh, actually, the only chemistry in this case is, uh, is the sodium hydroxide, uh, hydrochloric acid. Um, and of course, they can uh, basically just form salt and water when they're mixed. Uh, and the anti-scalant, uh, the silica. As I said earlier, if I'd have had my way, we'd have, we'd have gone to a two-step uh, pH adjustment. But uh, that's the only chemistry. The, the energy footprint, because of the evaporation, is huge. But the uh, client, you know, they made the ultimate decisions. And the ultimate decisions are not always in complete 
agreement with the consultant's recommendations. But uh, uh, it, it, it goes a long way uh, towards um, uh, at least recovering wastewater, which I think is, is, is the direction we have to go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.